On the edge of the capital, Manama, thousands gather for the funeral of a young man. Hani Juma was 32 years old and the father of two children. It's a scene repeated over and over in Bahrain, where there are more and more killings, more and more funerals, as the nation is torn by protests and a brutal government crackdown. I wanted to find out just what happened to the man whose death has brought so many onto the streets. But it's difficult moving freely here. I'm just approaching another checkpoint now. I find my way to this empty building on the outskirts of the city. So this is the building that Hani Juma's body was found in. He was pursued by riot police as they were conducting a sweep through the neighbourhood. Tirana Hassan, an Australian, is from Human Rights Watch's Emergency Response Unit. Essentially they found him lying unconscious where he had been bleeding out for about two hours. It wasn't easy to capture these images. Even though I have permission to work as a journalist here, it's clear that there are some stories Bahrain doesn't want the world to see. You can see from the nature um, of the blood here that there was an enormous amount of blood loss. And when we came, we found fragments of his kneecap. We also found one of his teeth. Tirana Hassan says that Juma wasn't even taking part in the anti-government protests when he was attacked. He was simply caught up in a police sweep when he went outside his home after hearing calls for help. What we found here is different to a number of the other investigations we've done. This was the scene of something calculated and cruel and carried out by riot police. Hani Juma was then taken to Bahrain's central hospital and stabilised. But doctors told Human Rights Watch that security officials came looking for him. They found him in a hospital bed and took him away. His body turned up approximately four days later. And the family was just told to come and collect the body. The mourners at Hani Jumar's funeral believe that what happened to him could happen to any of them. And funerals like this can quickly turn into anti-government protests, as this one has, with demonstrations now officially banned in the city centre. The uprising in Bahrain began in mid-February. Pearl Square in the city centre became like Cairo's Tahrir Square, the focal point of demonstrations. The government called for backup from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Then Bahraini police turned their guns on the protesters. Many civilians were killed. At the height of the violence, when medical help was critical, even hospitals came under attack by the military. This secretly filmed footage appears to show a male nurse being dragged behind bushes and bashed outside Bahrain's central Salmaniya hospital. Even doctors were targeted, like this woman, who wanted to speak to me, but was too afraid to show her face on camera. Every doctor that speaks out in the media is being arrested. She was waiting for an influx of seriously injured protesters 
when the riot police came to visit. We looked through our windows and we saw uh, um, vehicles, police, uh, riot police vehicles, and the riot police uh, just uh, walking around the, the gates and around the, uh, uh, ar the entrances of, S of Salmani Hospital. And then they occupied uh, all the entrances and exits of Salmania, not allowing anybody, whether a doctor or a patient, to come in or go out. Male staff nurses, they were dragged to the backside parking and they were beaten so hardly by the riot police uh, till they were uh, lying on the ground uh, and they couldn't move. They were just lying on the ground. What's the situation of Salmania? It's, it's like a prison now. It turned, around, it turned like a prison. Uh, nobody can come in or out unless going through several checkpoints. The administration now is military. I wanted to find out more about what happened there. And the doctor offered to take me to a man now in hiding. So just going to the house of someone who was a patient at Salmonia Hospital and He's going to tell us what it was like to be there. This man, who I'll call Ali, was also too afraid to be filmed. He had been injured by a shotgun blast while protesting at the Pearl Square roundabout and managed to get to the hospital. Ali told me that he and other patients had been forcibly removed from the hospital and were taken to a police station where the beatings continued. The access to health services uh, to the injured people um, is, a, is a guarantee uh, and people need to have the right to be able to access those. These are not uh, quasi-detention centres where people can be held um, incommunicado. Health facilities need to be places which are protected uh, and that medical professionals, uh, including paramedics and ambulances, can operate freely. As news of such atrocities leaked out, the government called a press conference, claiming security forces had actually liberated the hospital. Who blocked the hospitals? It's not the, uh, the government or the army. The army opened the hospital of Salmania because we have clear evidence and we have many cases to show and they can be provided to you how people were denied access to Salmania hospital and how Salmania hospital became uh, really a, a source of uh, misinformation and, and uh, also of, uh, in, in many cases, violence against uh, uh, nurses, doctors and patients. So actually the hospital was open and liberated for all to use it. And then they shooting people, killing people, beating people till death. But and this man down. believes none of what the government is saying. I opened the door and they push me and they say, where is your bedroom, where is your bedroom? And they were holding me from my shirt, pulling me from my shirt. And they went and pulling me inside, going up to my bedroom. Two weeks ago, Nabil Rajab was visited by 25 masked men with guns. There were police, military and thugs, outraged over his work as a human rights activist. I mean, while I was here in front of my children, they were insulting me, saying uh, all the secretarian statement and speech and accusation and telling me that you have to prepare yourself, we're going to rape you now. Nabil was bashed and interrogated for three hours before being released. He says he considers himself lucky. We have more than 100 people missing. We don't know if they're dead or alive. 
we have a lot of people got arrested, many political and human rights figures, human rights defenders are in detention now. Uh, Nabil questions what role the presence of a major U.S. naval base here has in the way the West has reacted to the violence. It is sad to see that, that their interest and their relation with those repressive regime has more importance than the life and the human rights of the people of this country. All over town, I find stories of abuse and fear. She's saying that um, she doesn't feel safe here to talk. Um, Democracy activist Zainab al Khawaji introduces me to her aunt Fatima, whose husband has now gone missing. If you can try not to get like the plate numbers or the, the house so that they don't get in trouble. Okay. Fatima tells me how her children had been forced to give up their father at gunpoint. <laughs> Fatima says she was then bashed and sexually assaulted. One week on from the raid, and still, it's clearly left its mark. Fatima has still not heard from her husband, and she fears she may never see him again. There needs to be an investigation uh, into those that have been disappeared. Information needs to be made available uh, on where people are uh, and uh, what charges, if any, they are being detained. You've said that you were hopeful that the society... Bahrain's Minister for Foreign Affairs says investigations are already underway. But he's not referring to his security forces, only to activists who've been locked up. I don't want to interfere with the course of justice. They will be tried before the courts, before the courts and uh, we will see the evidence against them. Let's not affect the course of the justice now and let's wait to see what the court says, please. And he insists that protests here have nothing to do with anti-government sentiment, but are the result of tensions between the majority Shias and Sunnis. They tried to push the situation to a sectarian way so that they present it as a Shia Sunni dispute. It's not like a dispute. People want a legitimate right. Yes, uh, the majority of people uh, protesting, they are Shias because they're more marginalized. They are more discriminated against, but doesn't mean that uh, the Sunnis are living in a beautiful heaven. The next day, security around town is as tight as ever. My camera down. Many of the highways are empty, with people preferring to stay in the relative safety of their homes. I try to reconnect with Zainab as her aunt continues a search for her husband, but again I'm blocked. The military didn't let us through. And we tried to get Zainab through as well, and they kept asking questions about her ID, so we thought it would be safer for her to go. Put down your camera. We're approaching another checkpoint now. Yeah. That night, I hear that another protest has started up, and I set off in search of it. The streets appear to be deserted. Eventually, I find it. A candlelit vigil in the suburbs. 
They know how dangerous this is, that police could come here at any time. But the urge for reform pushes them on. They tell me they'll be back again tomorrow night, and the night after that, and the night after that too.